All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode 93, bringing you all the best JavaScript news in a podcast form. And, well, it's December, so, you know, don't expect much from that. And we still have some pretty cool things today, but, you know, it's getting smaller and smaller, and I'm not honestly sure if there's going to be two next uh, episodes. I will tell you that I will definitely make the text files, as in, you know, the GitHub ones, but I don't know if I'm gonna stream them because there's like Christmas, New Year, and I'm not sure if I will have time, but we're, we're gonna see how that develops, okay? So let's get uh, cracking. As usual, the first section we got here is getting started. We got uh, quite a few articles here today that are pretty good. So the first one we got is building a Wikipedia app using React hooks with Aus Zero. So this is the, um, you know, the article from Aus Zero guys. So as you might imagine, they usually put in quite a lot of uh, specific description of how do you do things with Aus Zero. But this time around, it's actually a really cool app they built that interacts is basically a Wikipedia front end uh, that is built using Node.js, Next, Bootstrap, and then you use Passport, Authero, and uh, Mongoose for the DB uh, backend. Uh, it's quite decent. Again, you know, as you expect, there is a lot of Auth0 stuff in here, but other than that, it's a pretty solid introduction to the whole uh, stack that I just listed. So Next.js and uh, Bootstrap with Mongoose, as well as Passport and Othero for authentication. But hey, so if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a pretty good tutorial. Uh, hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. All right, uh, next article we got here is Inversion of Control from Mr. Cansey Dots. So this one is a really good write up on what is inversion of control, how to use it and why is it helpful. There is also um, Egghead's uh, video version here, which is probably cut out by something. There is a lot of stuff that is cut out from this page, but okay, let me just do that real quick. Uh, now, if you are familiar with the concept of inversion of control, you won't really find anything new here. It's a very basic tutorial. If the concept is new to you, then definitely do check it out. It's a very cool write up and it's also shows you how to use it in context of React at the very end. So if you are using React a lot, then this is probably a very good um, point to, you know, improve your knowledge. Okay, next article we got here is build a blog with Next.js, React.js, Strapi, and Apollo. So this is a write-up from the Strapi team, something that I don't think I've seen before that. So we looked at the Strapi at one of the uh, live streams. Uh, it's uh, basically a headless CMS, and this is a tutorial from them on how to build a blog with uh, Strapi as a CMS and then the Next.js as your frontend. Right, they did have another tutorial on the same thing, but with Nux.js and Vue, so this time around it's Next and React. You know, it's the same stuff basically, but with React, it's a very good written tutorial with uh, quite a bit of helpful information here, Apollo for GraphQL and things like this. So if you are interested in rolling your own blog and you want to use Strapi for content management, then do check this one out. It's actually a pretty good write-up. Okay, uh, next thing we got here um, is JSON parser with JavaScript. So this is uh, one of the articles that I think like one of the best ones this week. So this is a write up on how to write your own JSON parser with pure JavaScript without using any, you know, grammar parsers or g grammar generators or anything like that, which simplify things quite a bit, right? So this is like, write your own JSON parser by hand yourself, which is extremely painful, but will teach you a ton of things. Let me just allow a code sandbox in here and... Uh, so you got a bit more um, things you can see. So it's, as I said, you know, it's like starting from understanding the grammar, writing the grammar parser yourself, uh, figuring out how to process the strings. I remember doing something similar back in the university and I remember my head getting just basically exploding by the end I was doing this thing. I don't think I've ever finished it myself. I actually copied the code from uh, one of my um, fellow students, not, not, not the proudest moment of my career, but... It was hard at the time. Like when you just begin development, uh, doing parsers is damn hard. I mean, probably now it's gonna be a bit easier for me, but it's still like one of the trickiest topics out there. So if you are looking to improve your knowledge of JavaScript significantly, then I would highly recommend at least reading through the article because there's some really good points in here and it's a really, really good write-up on the whole like parsers and uh, syntax processing uh, topic basically. But yeah, it's, it's great, so do have a look. 
Okay, uh, next thing we got here is raw WebGL, another amazing article. So this is a tutorial for working with raw WebGL without using any third party libraries or tools, which is again, you know, crazy thing that uh, is probably an amazing learning experience, but also something you don't really wanna do in, you know, when you're building a final thing, unless you're building another low level library for working with WebGL like 3.js, for example. It's really well written. It explains you basically everything you need to know about the WebGL and how it works within the web uh, technologies. It also shows you all the tool you need and then explains you how to do basic thing like basically drawing this 3D, um, oh God, what do you call it? Triangle with colors, basically. I'm, <laughs> I'm really bad at naming things today for some reason, but there you go. So if you ever wanted to get into WebGL and you wanted a very low level introduction to it, including, you know, shaders and, and colors and all that kind of stuff that is absolutely crazy. And I, I personally have no idea about any of that. I probably should go through this tutorial myself because it's fascinating. Um, yeah, do check this one out. It actually does a very good job of giving you a solid intro to the WebGL as a technology. Right, and the next thing we got here is Mongoose 101, uh, introduction tutorial for Mongoose that basically teaches you everything you gotta know about the Mongoose itself. Uh, it does assume that you uh, have the MongoDB installed and you have basic understanding of what MongoDB is and kinda how it works. It's, you, you know, it doesn't have to be super in depth, but uh, you have to basically understand what it is and how do you use it. And then it just teaches you how the mongoose works, how to create models, how to create things, uh, uniqueness, restrictions, hooks, and all that kind of stuff. So if you are you know, getting started with databases, you just read about MongoDB and was looking for a nice library for it, then I can definitely recommend mongoose. It's pretty cool. Uh, and this is a pretty good tutorial for it. Um, Jack Black's younger, better looking sibling, and he teaches WebJL. Wait, what? <laughs> is, that, is that reference to my beard and hair? <laughs> that is, um, okay, that is not something I expected to see in my chat, but you know what, thank you, I'll take that. Okay, uh, coming back. So there was the last getting started section, uh, last article in the getting started section. Now we're coming to the articles. We got four of them today. The first one is a very, very, very big write-up on the differences between Node.js and uh, 10 and Node.js 12 LTS versions, which basically collects all the changes that happened between them ever. Like, um, it's just a bit crazy. So first of all, it splits them between the notable changes and everything else. And the notable changes you got like, you know, important stuff like, okay, FreeBSD 10 is no longer supported. We added broadly support. LibUV is now version 132 and so on and so forth, right? So there's like V8 changes. So very, very significant and important things, including ES module support, uh, which is experimental still, I think in 12 and things like this. And then um, you got minor notable changes that are, you know, less important. And at the very end, you just got like, look at the length of this thing. At the very end, you got um, just just basically all the commits with uh, some uh, like split again by categories, major, minor, uh, and patches. And you can just look through all of that to figure out what will break if you migrate from LTS 10 to LTS 12, which honestly shouldn't be much unless you are using FreeBSD, right? So there's like not that many breaking changes. Oh yeah, there will be breaking changes as usual if you are using the, if you're doing something with a, a node JIP, which, you know, uh, API changes because V8 changes and it can be a bit of a pain in ass to migrate native code. But uh, anyway, so if you are using Node.js 10 LTS and you were thinking for migrating to 12 and you want to know what exactly changed, do have a look at that. That is basically the most comprehensive guide you can find out there. Okay, next article we got here is micro frontends based on React. A pretty nice write-up on the topic of micro frontends, uh, specifically based on the React... Um, React specific micro frontends, which kind of defeats the purpose of micro frontends, but you know, let's just forget about that. Anyway, so this talks about what micro frontends are, why are they useful, how do you apply them in practice, which I honestly am yet to see any um, application that is convincing to me personally that couldn't be done with a monolith in a better way. So the only, um, you know, the only positive or like how do you, the only, oh God, 
what is it wrong with my words today? The only um, advantage I see of the... Um, what is wrong? Okay, let me try that again. The only advantage of micro frontends I personally see is from the organizational perspective, right? So when you got separate teams who work on a vertical slices of your app, like, okay, on the same frontend A and service A, and they can kind of work on this in isolation. And then there's another team that works on a frontend B and service B, and they work on it in isolation. And then you somehow assemble that into final app. Now, that still sounds like a nightmare to me, but I guess it kind of could work. And this is why the micro frontends were um, invented essentially. And this is basically what the article talks about. And then it introduces this uh, framework called Pyral that basically allows you to uh, build the final app from the existing micro frontends in a nicer way than essentially cobbling it down together yourself, right? So having another team that manages all of that, which kind of makes sense. But then again, you know, if you have a final app that has to be assembled together from micro frontends anyway, so why, um, I mean, yeah, okay, you know what? Let's not, let's not go into that direction. I already had that discussion with a, some people for a lot of time and I yeah I just fail to see the too much value from it. Like I can see some value, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, let me see the chat. We do it, works all right, but it gives you a lot of overhead in maintaining packages because each front end is a package. Yeah, so this is the thing, right? So in the end you just, it's not really you're building, uh, like the way I saw it at least implemented in majority of cases, it ends up not being like separate front ends that are then integrated together, but separate components that basically then are built into final big front end. And it's just like, I, I mean, I guess it's okay, but why couldn't you just do it as a monolith? But uh, anyway, the Pyral thing looks actually pretty nice. So if you are into micro front ends and if you were looking for the uh, library to use, do check this one out, it's actually pretty nice. Hey Memphis, welcome to the stream. All right, uh, next thing we got here is how we 30 x our node parallelism. So this one is a pretty neat write up that uh, explores um, running a lot of node workers in containers, in this case, like 4000 node workers, and figuring out where exactly things go wrong memory and performance wise, which is quite a task with this number of workers. Uh, so they talk like the article talks about how they set up the monitoring, you know, the Prometheus, Grafana, monitoring the V8 heap size, garbage collection, task latency and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. So if you are uh, working with a lot of distributed processing based on Node.js and you need to figure out where exactly you bottleneck, then this article basically explains how they did it, which would probably work for majority of people out there. Um, they have some really fancy graphs here. So you can, as you can see here, there's a heap usage and that definitely looks like a memory leak because it just basically uh, plateaus at the six gigs, which is the maximum they set and then just dies. <laughs> which, you know, that means you have a memory leak somewhere. So you got to figure out what exactly happening and uh, clean it up a bit. They also talk about how they track it down and how they optimized it, uh, how they figure out, you know, the heap usage. And uh, then there's also additional things like they yeah, are speeding up the JSON serialization. So they're figuring out the bottlenecks within the node modules, uh, reducing garbage collection time and GC pauses and stuff like this, which is, it, it, there's a lot of fascinating info in here. So again, if you're working with a lot of uh, distributed processing based on Node.js, do check this one artic uh, this article out. There is some very, very cool info and very interesting things that they are talking about. Let me have a look in the chat. Um, we don't do it to save work. We do it to compose different front ends for different audiences. Oh, I see. Okay, this makes, yeah, this this case makes a lot more sense. But then again, you don't really have micro front ends in this case. You still have just a set of components that are used to assemble the final front end, right? So this is what I see in the end because micro front ends means that the front ends that are assembled into the final app, they are independent and usually served by the different servers. So the final app is just acts as a sort of glue that shows them within that app, right? And having separate components is perfectly fine. So you still have the same monolithic architecture that is just compiled from different components, which is perfectly fine. So this is, this is a great approach and I love it. Okay, anyway, <laughs> continuing, um, we got what? We got the last article here for today. The problem with React Context API. So this is uh, the sort of quite obvious problem for people who already tried Context API the, and how to deal with it essentially. 
Uh, if you ever worked with React Context API, you know that you know once you wrap something in API and once you start consuming that API, uh, sorry, that context is what I want to say, uh, is um, essentially everything that consumes the context will re-render as soon as the context changes, irregardless to whether the thing that the context uh, that is used within the specific component is uh, used or not, right? So you get this count, you get the set counts, and once you trigger the set counts, both of those components will re-render because the whole context changed. So it doesn't matter if you change one thing or two, right? Which is something that is not quite obvious. There are ways around it. There are things that you can do to make that work a bit better. But anyway, this is like the thing that you have to keep in mind. And in some cases, this could be critical. In some cases, you don't want that. And in this case, it's basically better to just go with uh, Redux, MobX, or whatever the you know better solution to handling that. Essentially, this is yeah, this is essentially what the author says. There's also other ways of going around that, and the article talks about that. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a pretty good write-up. Okay, uh, before we go to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness, let me have a look at the chat. We eventually found out that the end users have trouble remembering too many URLs to visit to do their work. So we end up building a single front end to suit their needs instead of having many smaller ones. UX is absolutely the biggest problem with micro front ends I see because not it's not just like the technical challenge in there, right? But you have this mental overhead where you really have to remember where the hell do you supposed to go to interact with one things. And there's two ways of solving it. One, as you said, is just, okay, we'll build one big thing with dashboard or whatever that guides the users. Or let's do some sort of a technical magic that renders all of those smaller front ends on one page, which, you know, I, I tried to do that at one point. Like we had a project where we needed to do something like this. And we tried to use like iframes and web components and shadow DOM and all that stuff. And it never worked out quite well because if you isolate those micro front ends completely, it works okay, right? So, but as soon as you need to pass the data between them, it becomes an insane problem. <laughs> I'm not even sure if you can solve that, but yeah, it's just, I don't, I, like personally from all of my experience, micro front ends is just not worth it a uh, majority of time. But yeah, that's like, uh, UX is definitely something you have to keep in mind. Uh, I mean, for all the project, not just micro front ends, uh, but Okay, anyway, let us go into tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. The first crazy thing we got here for today is how Facebook avoids ad blockers. This is probably my favorite one. So if you ever try to block ads on Facebook, uh, you know that it's it's really, really hard. And majority of time, they actually uh, go through the um, cracks, basically, in ad blocking software. Uh, this is because Facebook does conscious efforts to combat the ad blocking by... Well, different nefarious means, to be honest. And uh, this article walks you through one of them, which is, um, well, quite crazy, right? So here's the thing. Instead of span sponsored, they actually split it into span that has single letters in them. So you got like sponsored vertically. And, you know, because we're rendering spans, the user still sees the normal word sponsor. Now, the thing is that they go beyond that and actually say, okay, so we got data content, which has the letters, and then this is rendered using JavaScript, which is, you know, makes it slower, but whatever. And then they obfuscate it, right? So they, okay, so you can actually create a rule that would block that display none. Well, not as easy, because then they wrap it in more spans, <laughs> which, which makes it harder to write, right? So then you can, okay, we can write different rule that would block that, but no, turns out if you write a rule like this, it screws up the word and then shows other stuff, which just not, like, I, I don't know how they do that, but that looks ridiculous. And it goes further beyond that. So it seems like Facebook has this unending combat with the ad blockers, which just goes like the, the approach they use is absolutely bonkers. And honestly, I feel really sorry for the developers who have to just sit there and come up with ways to uh, fight the ad blocking, which in turn ends up with, you know, the open source developers who maintain ad blockers and blocking lists come up with new ways to combat that. And then if your job is to like figure out every day on how to combat the ad blocking, <laughs> sounds like it would drive me nuts to be honest. But uh, yeah, if you are curious, do check this article out. It does um, a pretty good job of showing how, how insane it could get when you try to combat ad blockers, uh, specifically from the Facebook side. It's quite amusing. All right, um, next thing we got here is the, where is the title? What is happening? 
Where is the title of the article? I knew it was, is it, wait a second. <laughs> is it rendered with JavaScript? No, no, where's the title? Um, anyway, the title of the article is how to use new CSS uh, is selector for easy element targeting. So it turns out the CSS is getting uh, is pseudo class selector, right? That would allow you to uh, match a bunch of elements with a compound selector, uh, which actually looks really, really handy. So I believe it is still in like a proposal stage. So it's probably gonna come to Chrome Canary or whatever in the next few months. And the idea is that instead of writing a bunch of um, selectors that, you know, match one thing, which, you know, this doesn't look too bad, right? So when you just do like article section aside, this is fine. But when you have to match sub selectors like article H1, section H1, aside H1, it gets problematic, especially if you don't use something like post CSS or, you know, the SAS or whatever this is your preferred preprocessor. Now, the thing is you could actually use is selector in this case and say is article section aside and then just say H1 after that. And that would be exactly the same as this three different selectors in this case, which is um, quite unhandy, right? So, and the, it also works as a nested option. So you can actually combine them. And in this case, you know, here's like the, what you would write right now with like different article one H1, article two H2, article H3, article H4 and so on and so forth. And same for like section, same for a site. And then you can just replace it with one line of is selector, which looks incredibly handy. And you know, as I'm not exactly the guy who writes too much CSS, uh, but personally, the less pre-processing I need to write good CSS, the better it is. And seeing something like this shipped in um, browsers is really in core of the browsers essentially is really, really great. So if you're curious, do check it out. It's actually really, really nice. Uh, let me have a look in the chat. Looks like an ending fight. Well, I mean, ad blocking and ad um, like ad companies are always in an ending fight of kind of prevent that. I think they're actually getting quite good at this, but um, the Umetrics, in my opinion, does the best job of blocking ads because it literally just cuts out requests to the scripts and stuff. So <laughs> it doesn't even get loaded basically. Okay, um, in the future where personal computers have 16 cores but perform the same as now because 14 of those are dedicated to the ad block war. Um, yeah, that, that is, on one hand, that's a very grim future. On the other hand, it looks very realistic and it makes me incredibly sad. <laughs> but uh, as long as we have nice extensions such as uBlock Origin and uMetrics, um, it's gonna be okay, I think. I think we're gonna get by somehow. Again, there's the, uh, you have now the Safari and you have now the, um, a Brave, you have the pie hole and you have like a ton of other tools that do a really good job of cleaning that stuff up. Like not all of it, they still like, they still find their ways around them. But yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping that the ad industry would basically change to something performance friendly, I guess, or, you know, privacy and performance friendly. Let's just put it this way. But yeah, it's kind of, I wouldn't hold my breath, but it's just uh, kind of, wish for the new year, let's put it this way. <laughs> okay, anyway, continuing. We got an announcement from OpenJS Foundation. Electron joins the OpenJS Foundation. So it's now officially part of the foundation, which means it's gonna be maintained and updated by the foundation itself, which means Electron is not going anywhere, which in my opinion is absolutely awesome. Uh, would love to see it develop further push to the very edge of the basically performance and you know memory consumption and everything updated to be a lot more uh, leaner and faster and nicer. And ultimately, you know what I would wanna see? I would wanna see it integrated into the operating system. So just, just imagine, you know, right now, the problem, like the ma major problem with Electron is that every app ships its own uh, V8, ships its own browser, like the Chromium, and ships its own Node.js, right? Imagine all of that being already within your operating system so that the apps you ship would be just this tiny app code, which I mean, it, we're, we're kind of coming down to the browser basically. So I guess what I want to say is I want to see the Node.js integrated into the browser so we get, or maybe browser extended to get the Node.js capabilities so we can actually just ship our reach applications through the web, which would be freaking amazing to be honest. Um, yeah, progressive web app apps for the win basically and, um, 
in my opinion, basically the target of Electron is to disappear and merge with the browser itself so that the browser can build all that we build on Electron right now with less overhead, obviously. Uh, there was an interesting idea that I've, I've uh, stumbled upon basically recently is I'm using a lot of my apps as uh, progressive app apps that just, you know, popped out and uh, built like, for example, the Discord server we have. I have it as a progressive app app that is, this is a Google Chrome window, you know, and I have all my add-ons here. And this is the problem. Because this is a Google Chrome window, I cannot run this app uh, without running the whole Chrome engine. Uh, that's one thing. And second thing, when I run this, I also run all of those extensions, about 90% of which are not required within this window. So I would still want to run the uh, uBlock and uMatrix to block like tracking and ads, but I don't care about running like my password manager in here. I don't care about running my mission control for YouTube here. I don't care about running Tamper Monkey in here. So it would be cool if we would be allowed to run the progressive web apps within the specifically isolated environments that we configure without running the core of the browser. But this is like, you know, crazy thoughts, basically. Anyway, um, Electron, jo I somehow started with Electron and went to the progressive web apps. But anyway, uh, Electron is now OpenJS Foundation, which is great news for everyone, I think. And it's going to get developed further, updated. Uh, and yeah, it's now basically a core JavaScript technology, I guess. Right, uh, continuing, we got uh, today I learned tweets that uh, ES modules are actually import orders your export. Blah, blah, let me try that again. So ES module import orders your exports alphabetically. However you export them, it doesn't matter. They still will be ordered alphabetically. And that is per spec. So if you are using uh, exports, right? If you would do that through Webpack, you would actually get the same order as it was exported in the original file because the, the way it works in the Webpack is slightly different from the spec. But if you use it natively in the browser, it will be ordered alphabetically, which is again, something that is written down in spec. So keep that in mind if you rely on the order, which probably is a bad idea in general, but uh, there you go. And this is something that I think is a really nice a little detail that might bring some pain to those who are used to how the Webpack does things and rely on order, basically. Okay, and I think this is the last uh, little thing we got here is a PSA from NPM, guys. Update your NPM to version 6.13.4, or I think there's already been a couple of other minor updates because there was a pretty severe vulnerability allowing arbitrary path access in the previous versions and has been fixed in this version. So, you know, if you're using NPM, especially on servers or anywhere important, basically, do update it right now because uh, you're basically leaving a vulnerability open in there. Okay, that is it for the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we got a couple of releases this week. The first one is the November release of VS Code, bringing us, uh, well, this a lot of those improvements are just, you know, uh, like it, blah, iterative is, blah, what is wrong with me today? Iterative is what I want to say. Um, the cool thing that the Java developers, I think specifically would love is this nested uh, folder browsing. So you can actually now see the whole like nested Java stuff that you need to create in a nice one line instead of um, unfolding 200 folders, which is a nice addition, I think. Uh, you can also left side in diffs, which is something that wasn't possible before. It's something that didn't really bother me, to be honest, but uh, I know some people are annoyed by that. So now I can do that. And you can finally, finally save from the peak editors. So this is something that I personally waited for <laughs> quite some time. But uh, yeah, there's a, a ton of improvements as usual. So do check it out. Um, as, as usual, like, you know, the VS Code, is, as you might or might not know, is my preferred editor of choice. It's amazing, and I absolutely love uh, pretty much everything about it. So there we go. Okay, uh, the second release and the last release of the week we got here today is Preact version 1.10 with two major highlights. The first being the uh, Preact DevTools. So we Preact now has its own separate DevTools that are uh, now supported by the Preact itself, and you can use them, and they look actually pretty impressive. And the second one is the suspense list component, which is um, an interesting addition, something I don't think React actually have an equivalent for, which is also interesting. You know, the Preact started as a sort of smaller React and now it's just going beyond what React does, which is kind of uh, curious. So suspense list allows you to reveal uh, suspense components in a specific order. 
So basically this would wait for all of them to load and then reveal them from top to down, right? So the forwards order, backwards or together if you want to for all of them to load, which sounds quite handy to be honest. So uh, it's kind of interesting to see if that would make its way to the React or not. Or maybe it is already in React. Maybe I just don't know something, but I don't remember seeing anything like that in React. Let me just have a quick look. Uh, React.js concurrent modes, is it? Is it in here? Oh yeah, it is in React. Okay, so I'm just an idiot and didn't know it exists. <laughs> okay, I guess it got ported to Preact is what I want to say. I should really try to play with pre, uh, Suspense in React at some point because I haven't actually tried it beyond the simple demos when it was just released ages ago. So yeah, there we go. Okay, um, that is it for releases. Now we got a bunch of libs and demos here. The first one is Geo API, a lightweight, a blah. let me try that again. Lightweight API service to get geolocation data from IP addresses, um, which is, yeah, is, you know, if you need to uh, reverse geocode IP addresses to uh, countries and regions, then this seems to be like a pretty nice option. It's, yeah, it's, it's free. So I guess this is like one of the good points about it. I don't know how hard it is to actually find a service like this because I never needed to reverse geocode, reverse geocode IP addresses. It was also always related to reverse geocoding coordinates, but uh, there you go. Uh, suspense, yeah, Suspense is definitely in React already. I just didn't know they had Suspense list component because last time I touched the Suspense, it would just basically just released and was very bare bones, but uh, looks like I'm out of date on this. Okay, anyway, continuing the next thing we got here is Smart Nightlight Manager. This is a demo uh, from a guy who builds a node app for controlling his kids' nightlights uh, via the website or IoT buttons. So if you ever wanted to go into, you know, the whole smart home thing and you own a Philips Hue or were looking at them, and wanted to build your own thing, do check this one out. So it basically allows you to remotely control Philips Hue lights using either the uh, Amazon buttons or using the dashboard that you can run locally, which uh, looks pretty fancy. So you can even set like colors and timers and stuff like this, which is, um, yeah, looks quite nice. So I'm still thinking, you know, whether I should jump or not uh, on the, the whole like smart home, smart lights thing. I did recently install the smart thermostats, which was quite damn handy to be honest. So I'm now considering maybe I should also buy some smart lights. Uh, that might be a fun little project. But yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Right, next thing we got here is Formiz, a React forms with easy validation and multi-steps. So this is, um, yeah, basically the form management, yet another one. This time around with the uh, embedded multi-step management, which is quite damn handy. Um, let me just uh, type something. Uh, yes, it is indeed more React stuff. I mean, what do you expect from me? I'm working on React predominantly, so you know. There you go. It actually looks quite nice, so it allows you to do wizards. It has the validation integrated. The API seems pretty straightforward, and uh, yeah. Right, uh, next thing we got here, yet another React library that is especially for you, Memphis. <laughs> React use fuzzy. Uh, so this is the uh, React hook for client-side fuzzy search using Fuse.js. Something we actually did for the BEX.js uh, dev website. <laughs> Sorry, I, kinda, I couldn't help that. Uh, so this is something we did for the uh, BEX.js website, but in this case, this is like a purely client-side, no web workers or no fancy stuff, just a simple hook wrapper that allows you to search for uh, things. Uh, nothing, you know, super complicated here. Uh, if you were ever curious uh, to learn how to use your hooks, I guess, create them. Uh, it's It looks it looks fine, right? Nothing super uh, complex, as I said. But then again, if you have a very large data set, you might want to consider doing something like we did on a BXJS website, which is using a um, specific web worker that actually, uh, where did we do that? There we go. Uh, that actually has the data within the worker and searches asynchronously so that you don't lock your front end because Fuse is not exactly the most, um, you know, performant thing. And I mean, full text fuzzy search is just in general, not exactly cheap operation, right? So there you go. Okay, continuing, we got AppWrite, um, as they describe it, end-to-end -end backend server for front-end and mobile developers. I think by end-to-end, -end they mean all-in-one server because end-to-end -end backend server doesn't really make too much sense to me. But essentially, it's sort of all-in-one thing, uh, all-in-one backend that has um, 
authentication, accounts, user management, team, database management, storage, locales, avatars, all of that pre-baked. So you can just, you know, you take it, configure it, and then start using it with your uh, web, with Android, iOS clients, or whatever you can imagine. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It actually looks quite nice. Okay. Next thing we got here is Suite Confirm JS, uh, zero dependency, less than 450 bytes, gzipped, pure JavaScript and CSS solution for drop um, annoying pop-ups confirming the submission of your gut. That is a long description. You know what? It's just a very nice small uh, pop-up for confirming things, right? So zero dependencies, very tiny. Looks quite nice. Uh, there is a demo. Where was the demo? It wasn't just the image, but yeah, there you go. So basically, you know, it's, it's I think it's reminiscent of the, um, what do you call it? Uh, Sweet alerts, right? I think this is the naming schema, but it all, uh, all this sort of uses this UX schema of when you do it on the button, right? So sort of you push the button, you hold it. I am not sure if I'm a fan of holding. I'm also not sure how exactly that works with, um, Accessibility, because this this got to be the worry here, right? So it's, it looks like a decent UX option, but accessibility might not be that good. That's an open question, basically. But it's, it's an interesting component nonetheless. It's also tiny, so why not check it out? Right, next thing we got here is Next Translate, um, Next.js specific translation solution that also works statically, which is a neat little detail. So if you're building a Next.js based website, you want to do translation and you want to statically translate your stuff, then this might be option for you. Uh, it has support for uh, basically whatever you expect from uh, having a translation and an internationalization component, including, uh, what was it? There's a list somewhere. Uh, yeah, plurals, uh, what, basically whatever you can imagine, it seems to be all here. It seems to be based on E18N uh, spec. So, you know, the using default libraries, which quite uh, looks quite nice. Uh, the, what I found interesting is that it's specifically built around the Next.js, so it won't work with anything else, basically. It's quite interesting to see how Next become this sort of a powerhouse of everything for building websites. And now there's tools that build around it, which is um, honestly fascinating. But there we go. Okay, continuing, we got query QL, uh, easily add filtering, sorting, and pagination to your Node.js REST APIs through your old friend query string. So this is sort of a middleware that allows you to uh, simply add advanced querying capabilities to your REST API by just passing parameters through the query string, which I guess could work quite fine. I mean, if you need something that complex as you know shown in here, I would honestly recommend using GraphQL because doing that through REST API is a bit of a pain in ass. But if you already have some sort of a legacy REST API where you just want to add these capabilities without rewriting everything to GraphQL, this might actually be quite a nice option. So there you go. Okay, next thing we got here is Code Lift, a no code UI for your existing React code that uh, looks like a nifty idea. I'm not sure how useful that will be in the long run, but the gist is you can basically inject uh, the code lift register in your app. And then once you start it, it will create this sort of a front end that in addition to showing you your um, app itself will show the bars on left and right, where you can dynamically access and edit your uh, HTML tree. It seems to be focusing on CSS, and specifically in this case, it showcases the Tailwind CSS class changes that you can do live, which I guess would be quite nice for prototyping, but I'm, yeah, you know, beyond the prototyping, I'm not sure it has any uh, like significant value to be honest. It also doesn't seem like you could save any of those changes back to the uh, source code, which makes it a bit harder to work with, I guess. And there's no way to easily copy that. Uh, so it's, it's, I mean, it definitely has its value and it looks ni uh, like nice, but I'm not convinced that at this stage is going to be a useful tool, basically. But it's a nice demo, so there you go. All right, next thing we got here is App Intro Lottie Expo. So this is a tutorial that uh, shows you how to build um, uh, this sort of fancy animated intro to your React uh, apps using the Lottie, which is this super fancy animation tool that we talked about about a year ago, I guess. 
uh, for next, uh, sorry, for React Native. Uh, and uh, yeah, there was also an article somewhere, but I couldn't find it. I think, ah, there we go. There's a, at the very end, there's an article link. I did not include it into the uh, podcast itself because it's on Medium and Paywalled. So, you know, if you have ways around it, then go ahead and read it. If not, then, well, just look at the repo. It's actually, well, a pretty nice structure. The code is documented and everything. So it's a very nice learning material. Okay. Next thing we got here is unzip, the simple async unzip library for Node.js, a very straightforward lib to unpack files with promises support. If you were ever looking for something like this, do check it out. Um, from my experience, I mean, this could be useful, obviously, but from my experience, you would usually want to do some stream processing when unpacking stuff. So you usually want it returned as a stream rather than the promise that you can just await. And it seems to have decent amount of, you know, rules and stuff, uh, configuration options. So if you just need to unpack files with some mild rules, then this might work perfectly fine for you. If you want anything co more complex, then I would suggest taking a stream based like tar or something like this. But anyway, it looks quite nice. Okay, last thing we got here for today for libs and demos is React tabs. This is an official uh, React community library that is um, accessible and easy tab component for React. So accessibility is a very important point here, which is kind of great. So it's, yeah, you know, it's nothing fancy, it's just a tab components, but it is accessible. So you can easily throw it into anything. It also supports nested tabs and everything, uh, which is kind of good. So if you are looking for accessible tabs um, that are flexible and uh, well-maintained, then do check this one out. All right, this is it for the libs and demos. We got two interesting things today to close this off. Number one, the new book from Dr. Axel Rauschmeier is now available. It's called Deep JavaScript and it's a in-depth dive into everything JavaScript. Basically, you can read about 50% of it online and then you can uh, buy the rest if you want. It's just 30 bucks, which is honestly nothing. Um, you know, if you're if you... If you have seen any materials from Dr. Axel, you know that his stuff is amazing and it's definitely worth the full price. So go support him, go read the book. It's great. I mean, I've looked through the free stuff and I've, uh, I'll probably grab it next week sometime and read through it because that looks damn good. So um, yeah, there you go. That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, this article that I found pretty damn good. I mean, I wouldn't even call it an article. It's more like a collection of bullet points the things end users care about, but programmers don't. And this is a collection, as it says, of things that basically you as a developer usually forget about. And I would say that I'm guilty of, of quite a lot of this. <laughs> like there's a lot of things that I never honestly think about. And um, I guess users do, right? So there's like starting from obvious things like easy to install, easy to update, easy to backup, easy to recover and go into more complex UX things like you know, customizable keyboard shortcuts, undo everywhere, multiple undos and things like this, which again, you know, when you read that, they make perfect sense. But uh, when you code your thing, you just never seem to think about most of those things. So uh, there you go. If you're building a user facing app and you care about your users, do have a look through that list. It is actually quite damn good. All right. That is actually it from my side for the episode 93. Uh, if you have any questions, suggestions, links that I missed or any things you might want to discuss, feel free to throw them into the Twitch chat right now. If not, then uh, basically let me just tell you what's happening. So um, you can, as usual, you can find all the links that I've talked about today on the GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Uh, we have a Discord chat that you can join and chat about all things JavaScript and video games. Um, there is a Telegram channel where I collect links over the week and I basically, it's unfiltered. There's a lot of garbage that I throw out before the podcast later on. But if you're curious as to, you know, the amount of things that I collect over the week, you can follow me there. I have a Twitter where I sometimes post interesting JavaScript stuff and again, video game stuff. Uh, and uh, that's basically it. Doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. So I guess thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, as usual, if you missed some parts of it, the VOD will be available immediately on Twitch and on YouTube after some time. And 
I'm gonna be streaming some video games either later today or tomorrow. So we got some Transport Fever 2, which is supposed to be very, very good transport simulation, something I really dig. So if you're curious, do follow me and, uh, you know, join the stream to see me play video games as, you know, this is probably what you're missing in your life. But okay, that's basically it. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, really cool to hear all those words of support from you guys. Yeah, I uh, hope you enjoyed the show. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching the VOD of this. Um, in case I will not be streaming the next two podcasts, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Although I will probably stream something. And I see you next time. Bye.